forward. Hello everyone, I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have Tisa Curran here, who is a licensed midwife that owns and operates Antelope Valley Birth Center in California. Thank you so much for being with me today, Tisa. You're welcome. I am going to make sure I close everything too, sorry. Yeah, you don't even need distractions. All these I windows. think we get enough pop-ups in today's life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Tisa, I really appreciate your time. Yeah. This this afternoon for me, but it's still morning for you. So thank you. Um, I know you said you were very busy. I'd love to learn about your journey to midwifery and how you started this amazing birth center. Awesome. Um, okay, so yes, I'm Tisa. I live in uh, we'll call it Southern California, just outside of the northernmost part of LA County called Lancaster Palmdale, um, California. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's out of LA. So most people, um, we kind of consider it the LA area. It is up in the high desert. So you're, it's a whole different environment from the LA basin area. And um, the birth center, I've been in practice for six years. The birth center was started five years ago. We're coming up on our five year anniversary in a couple of weeks which will be February 3rd. So I did, I, I, here in the state of California, we have uh, two different midwife types, uh, CNMs and LMs, licensed midwives, and I'm an LM. I, this is my second career. I started out in the Air Force as an aircraft mechanic. I did that for 12 years. And when I decided to leave that career field, I actually went and took my GI Bill, went back to school got a business degree um, because that's what they would pay for. They wouldn't pay for midwifery school. So I, I went as took my GI bill and I got paid to go to school. So I took the money that I was getting paid to go to school, to business school and paid for midwifery school. So I did both degree programs at the same time. Um, I was pregnant with my, my sixth baby at the time. Yeah, it was insane. There was actually a, a post recently about from a student who was asking like, how do you work and go to school and take care of your kids? And I'm like, hmm, hmm. I can relate I to that too, days. Tisa, during graduate <laughs> school, I worked weekend as a, a nurse and then I did clinicals mm -hmm. and then I had two of my babies during graduate school. So yes, right? I, it's all a blur. We like, all do I, it. You exactly. can do it, but we it blurs, it. yes. <laughs> and, it, and I tell people all the time, it's not, it's not, you know, um, special to midwifery. We like a lot of career fields as mothers, um, you know, yeah, we all make sacrifices when we want to advance our careers, going to school and taking care of kids at the same time and, and doing clinical rotations. You have to do it as a doctor. You have to do it all kinds of stuff as, as other um, higher, higher professionals, you know, like if, if you're getting into other kinds of professions that you're like CEOs and, and things like that. So we're not, we're not, I don't think we're unique in that situation. I think we're a little bit more unique as, as in the, maybe the 24 hour coverage. If you're someone who's working 24 hour shifts, that kind of stuff, but doctors do that kind of stuff all the time too. So we're not unique. Um, but it is, it's crazy. I, I don't know. Uh, it's like you said, it's all a blur, but I did go back to school, got my midwifery degree and my business degree within a couple of months of each other. And I knew when I had started the birth, when I became a midwife or when I even considered being a midwife that this was my goal was to open a birth center in our community because I knew that it needed it. There was not a single one here. Um, LA would have been the closest and it still is. Um, so I knew that's what I wanted to do because it's a very, there's there's just a lot of varying different, it's, it's we're so close to LA, but we're very rural. And there's only one birthing hospital in, the valley that the birth center is located in. It's right across the street from the hospital, but we service uh, families almost a hundred miles away from the birth center. Yeah, so we have a very big uh, area, a service area. We still do a lot of home births as well and do the traveling for that. So um, birth center started, we bootstrapped it. I'm very proud of that. We started out with uh, just paying months a month like we we found an office space we started gutting it um we took our we opened in february our first birth occurred in june we had a very busy practice at the time probably doing five to seven birth home births a month at that time so i was using all my income to fund the birth center remodel and 
opening. So we, my husband, and when I say we, I mean me and my husband. My husband is definitely my business partner. Um, you know, we did everything in the birth center. I wish I was at the birth center right now so I could show you, but we took that down from a very common clinical uh, office, like a medical office with a bunch of exam rooms and a waiting area. And we tore out rooms to make the birth rooms. We tore out the office space to make a more, you know, uh, less formal waiting space for people to sit in added the bathrooms, added the, the showers and all that. We did that all ourselves, maybe three times in the last five years, I've called in a contractor just to add in, add in the piping and stuff. But we, we did all the fixtures. We did all the drywall. We did all the painting. We, we, we hauled out all the. You sound very similar to the birth center I had in Michigan. Right. <laughs> same thing. It was a cute farmhouse that a chiropractor had done. And my husband's the same way. He was my business partner. He did the accounting, the backdrops, and he made the birth rooms. We, we just, we lived in the upstairs. That was our house payment the first wow. year. I mean, we made sacrifices. Like I, when you're telling exactly. your story, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what we did when we started our birth center. You can do it multiple ways. You can start small and grow and make some yes. adjustments, or you can start big and have different streams, but uh, keep going. I just, yeah. I loved hearing your story because it reminded me of when we did our birth center starting. <laughs> right. Well, that was definitely the biggest concern of ours. You know, when you go from being a home birth midwife to doing a birth center, you're always concerned about whether or not you'll have the amount of clientele to cover the expenses of the birth center. So we wanted to mitigate that frustration by um, negotiating a very, very good lease rate for us to, in exchange to do all of the tenant improvements. And because of what I had seen, there was actually a couple of birth centers that were coming up at the same exact time that I had started mine, and they contracted their tenant improvements into their loan, yeah, into their lease agreements, and they were three times more expensive than mine. So, and I remember talking to those midwives and listening to them, you know, like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get enough people to cover the expense, you know, so I, I was so happy that we did it the way we did it, because we don't owe anybody anything right now. Um, and it it's ours and every time I go in there like there's just a sense of pride as well just seeing that that was all of our hard work that we put into it but um and we recently um today is you know this is the beginning of January 2021 and uh we just expanded by another 900 square feet this weekend so we took so yeah we just took um so the that was always you know every time that we had started to make more improvements with the birth center. We started out with one birth room and a big, huge classroom. And then, in, and I knew that there was more need for two birth rooms. So we converted our, our classroom into another birth room. Um, and then I started hiring staff. So I had to change a little bit of the birth center into an office space. Um, and not until I was really busting out the seams, you know, we were literally changing furniture every single day during clinic to make everything work in this, in this you know, what was 1700 square feet is what the original birth space is right now um, up until last month because I had seen the office space right across the hall go up for rent I waited and negotiated so that I pretty much got that for free when I when I um, upped my lease this this year You're so, so smart. I was waiting I knew that place was going to sit empty for a really long time um, so I waited for it to be empty for six months and then made them an offer and they took it so I'm very happy we just moved all our office space across the hall so now we have two fully like um dedicated exam rooms with a lobby and our office space for all our staff and then we have a, an actual break room now instead of it being you know kind of in the middle of all our common space um and then a, our original birth center now has full two full-time birth rooms and a family room and then we have all our space for um, has like our biohazard and stuff like that. That's all kind of more, more dedicated now. So I really, I'm really happy about it. It's still, we're still trying to move all the furniture. We're still hanging things up on the wall. We're, we're doing things like that this week, but, um, so far I'm really happy with it. Well, I was just thinking, Tisa, before we started recording, you had told me the business side doesn't stress you. And, and that's a rare thing I hear with midwives. And now that you're talking, I'm like, you have the mind of a business owner. And some people right. get that innately. They have a mentor. If you want to talk a little bit about your just your career pathway of you hinted 
two schools at once, like getting business school with midwifery, do you feel like it really helped you a lot with thinking differently or critically planning the birth center? I'm going to say no, because um, I'm a big, my personal opinion about business school is a waste of money and time. Um, But that's what, that's what my GI bill paid for because business school is really meant for CEOs. It's meant for people who are going into corporate America, not so much for the private business owner. And that really, I've taken so many courses over the years to strengthen my business skills as a, as a private business owner. And that's so a lot of your education from. is more self additional yeah. outside of whatever Absolutely. traditional school. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I definitely just had, like you said, I have the, it's part of my being. It's who I, I was always a business owner. I always wanted to work for myself and I would never be happy working for anybody else. So, um, yeah, like I said, we, you know, I started out in the military mostly because, um, I was a teen mom. I was 16 years old when I had my first baby and I just need to get out in the world and start taking care of myself. I've always had that, uh, personality where I just need to get business done. So I joined the military, um, gave me a, you know, a good start in life, having a, a career and a paycheck to support my son and myself and, and get us out there. And plus my, my whole family, there isn't a single, um, male person in our family that has not served in, in the armed forces. So it's kind of ingrained in our family. My husband was in the military. My, my oldest son that I was just speaking of, he's, he was in the military as too. So it's just very ingrained in our family. I appreciated my time in the military, but I was done, um, when I reached a certain point. And when I came out of the air force, I actually started a cloth diaper service. That was my first business venture. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) So I started that. Yeah, and it was great. It was, um, it ran, it took off and ran, but then I had to make a decision about midwifery school. I couldn't run the business, go to school and, you know, do everything um, because school was a full, having two different degree programs at the same time was a full-time job for me alone. So I sold the diaper service, uh, became a doula to do, to make the extra money and to really have that foothold in the community as a birth person. Mm -hmm. So, um, did doula work for, I don't know, five years. Um, no, probably less than that. Cause I did finish my degree program pretty quickly. Um, probably two and a half years because I had the bachelor's already. So, and for us, for the LMs, it's usually a four to five year program. So, um, yeah, I mean, while I was in midwifery school, after I'd sold the diaper service, I just, uh, ran a doula business. I was doing doula birth during school. So that gave me a little bit of an understanding of birth work and the business side of things as well. But as soon as I became a midwife, I did home birth for less than a year before I opened the birth center. I was going to ask you, do you feel like that was a wise decision or was it just adding another setting location and extra? You know, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to say that for probably a lot of people, it wouldn't be wise. Um, I just, because I have that strong foothold in business management, I, I knew that I could do it okay. now it, because for a brand new midwife, what you really want to be focusing on in the first couple of years is strengthening your midwifery skills. Correct. So it was, it was quite a challenge, like learning the business side of of midwifery and learning to be a midwife all at the same time. Plus there's no midwives in our community. So I was working alone um, and there's no birth centers. And the, the community where I set up the birth center was very hostile as well. So at the time when I set up the birth center, there was a lot of backlash from the medical community, but thankfully that has all been flattened out. And I, I did a really good job at establishing a good relationship. And and if you want to expand a little bit more on the establishing the relationship, I see that a lot of times in groups and resources, like how to connect, how to make a good impression, especially if they want a birth center, a long established entity of consistent transport to that place. Do you have any advice for midwives how to get that? I started out in a few, like there's, that's a really good conversation. I could probably talk an hour alone, but what I did was 
I made sure that um, whenever I did have a transfer that it was very professional. And the, I think the biggest advice that I can give to any kind of home birth midwife or, or a brand new birth center is to make sure that your charting looks legitimate. Because what happens with, um, with small practices is that we tend to not really chart like a medical professional. We, we chart differently when we're home birth midwives. Um, and it's, it's some like, guess what? There's a lot of stuff that you're never going to learn in school that you're going to have to do additional career training on. And charting is definitely one of them. Running your business is definitely one of them. If those are things that are not part of school, guess what? Suck it up and go find a training and, and do it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I just hate people complaining about stuff like that. That's not your school's job to teach you that. So go out there and take a, a professional like medical charting class and you know, straighten up your charts because that's what doc, like that's the first line of communication between you and the transferring physician. And if it looks like crap, they're going to be like, who is this nut job? And what is she bringing me? So that was definitely where I felt like if, if we could do that, if we could at least make sure that the charting looks legitimate, like we look like a medical practice, then they would receive me like a medical practice. Okay. Um, and then, like I said, I did not back down when, when I, when I went into the hospital, I actually had an interaction with a doctor who was refusing to accept a report from me. She did not want to come out. You know, she was like, the nurse can talk to you. And I said, no, and cause in the state of California, it's actually part of our law that we have to give direct report to the physician taking on care. So I called the, it was called the nurse advocate. Yeah. you probably know what that is. I called the nurse advocate and I said, look, I, I've got a physician here who won't accept my report. And she looked at me, she goes, oh, really? She goes, I will handle that for you. And she went and got the doctor and the doctor came out and took my report. And that never happened again after that, ever. Yeah. So every, I just did not, like, I think that it's really important um, not to walk into the hospital with the tail between the legs type of like, here's my transport, please help me. No, very like straightforward. This is what I got going on. And, and kind of, I, I knew that I had to like develop some skills to communicate on their level. Basically, I didn't walk in and be like, so I got this mom and you know, she's, she's 41 weeks pregnant. No, I've got a G3 P2. She is 41 and one. She came in presenting with X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? It very like communicate on their level. You're on their turf. So communicate with them on their level. Um, so that's how I made a lot of, I think it was just, a, just showing that I had, um, that professionalism. And then also I never brought in a train wreck. Like I conducted myself in my practice, like I should, we didn't bring in people who, you know, I didn't do like the 72 hour P ROM without any antibiotics. And, you know, like I tried really, and gave really good informed consent to my clients and charted it like nobody's business. Like I was a lawyer. You know, um, so that's where I think that it was very um, advantageous after a while. People started to realize like, okay, she knows what she's doing. She knows what she's talking about. Um, and then I had a very unique uh, opportunity that presented itself about two years ago because of the, because of the advancement of moving into Medicaid. When I started taking Medicaid a couple of years ago, I was actually becoming contracted with the Medicaid system. So uh, some of the local practices, the OB practices were starting to hear about me because people were being referred to me. You know, the, the medical or the insurance companies were referred, like this, this individual would like a midwife. So we're referring her onto this practice. So a lot of practices were having to forward records to me and they're like, who are you? And, and what, you know, like they had no idea I was there, right? Um, well, one, one FQHC contacted me one day, which is a federally qualified health clinic. For those that don't know what that is, those are federally funded uh, clinics. And they contacted me and said, we heard that you were, um, some of our patients are transferring to you. We'd like to meet with you. And so I said, okay, well, let's see what this is about. Well, they offered me a job in their clinic and I took it. I took a clinical position inside of an FQHC, which was absolutely unheard of, especially as an LM. Uh, CNMs not, you know, obviously CNMs work in the clinical setting all the time. Um, 
and I did that because I wanted to establish that relationship in the community with, with OBs and, and other practitioners. Well, that started a whole chain of events where other offices in this community started reaching out and hiring CNMs. So from the day that I was hired, now the hospital has three to four CNMs on staff, and that had never happened in 20 years. They had never had a CNM work in the hospital. hospital. The momentum you're putting in the community. Exactly. And then the the clinic that I work in, um, I had another CNM uh, get hired there. And then recently I just resigned there this year. So that way I could focus more on you know, running my practice. I had no more time to give to that, to, to that. I was going to say, but it taught me a lot. It all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to do it. I think I was working there two days a week and then I, you know, I was doing everything I usually do, but they were so flexible too. They knew that, you know, I was on call for births and that I might be calling in and that I might have to leave early and it seemed to always work out. It just always worked out for me. So as it usually does, awesome. um, so, so do that, you have any partners became, at this point with all the fun projects no. being well established? No. And um, I guess, when no. do you get to the point, I know we hinted before we started recording, you were going to start looking for somebody. When do you feel like in your practice is a good time to consider a partner or look at it when you're solo for a while? When did you hit those, those, those um, things? For me, it was more about the money, obviously. You always got to consider whether you can pay somebody else's paycheck and not leave them hanging, right? And I think that there's a number of ways to do that. And I'm sure you've had interviews with other practices that have done it different ways. But, um, you know, I've always used uh, another midwife from around the, the surrounding communities if I needed to take a, some time off and have them cover my practice and stuff like that. But, and you're just paying them per a, per a birth or per, per Yeah, per independent contract kind of stuff, relationship. Yeah. This, mm-hmm. Right. But um, I definitely, I had an opportunity to hire one of my graduating students this last year. Um, And that transition was pretty well because, you know, being, she already knew my practice. She already knew how I needed things done. And it it was a very good transition. Plus she had already been there for a year and a half. So the clientele already knew her as well. So that was super easy. I think that's the easiest way to start out is to have a, a, you know, a student that's already been a part of your practice. And then she had a family emergency and had to leave. And I was stuck doing solo again when I'd already adjusted my practice to have two midwives. So I had to quickly start um, interviewing. And I did, I think um, we were without a second midwife for six weeks before I hired another one, which was also a brand new grad. Um, but it, was um, she's been there since September now and really kind of getting the hang of things. And, you know, obviously new grads are the easy, like not the easier way to go. It's very time consuming to have new grads because of the amount of work that you have to to put into training them into this kind of environment. Um, Plus they need a lot of oversight as well until they are really ready to be alone as solo provider. Um, so it's a little bit like having a really highly qualified assistant right now, but I can deal with that. I can, I can deal with that. Um, but I think the point where, you know, it's just, uh, you got to figure out what your tipping point is financially for, for me, it was more than five births a month. And then on a, I, I too was at the point, like you just, like we talked about before, we got recording is that I'm getting, I I was getting close to burnout and that something had to change. And regardless of whether I could, I thought that I could afford another midwife financially, it had to happen. And what I have found is that it actually got easier. Once I hired the second midwife, Um, things just fell into place and more money came. So I, I think I, I overthought the process a little too much and was a little too hesitant to hire and be responsible for somebody else. But once it actually happened, um, it was incredible, like how everything fell together. And and I think it's unique. Midwives have that cycle. They have to think, okay, this lady's nine months in advance. We have some late transfers, but most make the decision at the beginning. 
am I going to be able to be financially like you have to think in such a unique parameter because especially if you're accepting insurance you're going to get paid if you're lucky three to six months after the birth so you've got a year and a half of caring for people right. you have to have a reserve you have to have backup plans. you have to have a budget that can handle the yeah. ups and downs and some midwives plan that and some don't so right. I think it's great that you brought it up because it is a vicious cycle that people are hesitant to jump but then they make it and they're so grateful they did Yeah, they, um, so the, I think, I don't know how I would have done it. I hope, I hope that it just, it really worked out for me because remember I said, when I started taking insurance, I didn't get paid for a really long time. Um, because I was doing that all by myself and kind of, we had a whole year where we didn't get paid, you know, we didn't take home a paycheck for a whole year. So I took on that burden. We took on that burden and barely made it through it. But it, but this year we doubled our volume with COVID and then all the insurance payments started coming in. So it kind of just worked itself out just from that aspect alone because of, you know, the doubling in the volume and, and then my insurance finally kicking in and getting a few back payments all at the same time. I'm now able to have that reserve and, and move forward. Um, I think that is probably the biggest challenge for most practices because it, we are so unique in the in the maternity world and billing that you don't. And once you start taking insurance, you're working without any funds. Where with our cash pay clients, they're paying us every month, and we we have some kind of reserve right there. But then also, what is very beneficial is having a very solid cash pay base practice to begin with that you're not reliant on the insurance payments as well. And that really worked out for me as well at the very beginning when I first started taking Medicaid, it was the only thing that held us through was our cash payments. Well, and I think Until it's unique to, no, I so. think it's great because when you're starting a business, like when I talk to midwives and we do a business plan, the, the part everybody thinks about is, oh, the room and the building. And I'm like, your most expensive part is that overhead for your practice the first year and a half, two years. Like you have to have a reserve. It's not just three to six months of an emergency account for a typical midwifery practice. If you don't have a side job or you don't have already something established, like a home birth practice is revenue. It makes it very, very difficult to start a birth center and do insurance right from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, like I said, I think I've just had some really good luck on how everything kind of transpired because we, like I said, we've never had to take out a loan or anything or, or have any, um, like big business loans out because of that. So I guess the last question I'll have for you, Tisa, you've been a wealth of knowledge and I hope we could do this again. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, you have done so many wonderful things over the years. How do you balance that work-life balance? How do you make time for vacation? How do you put boundaries? Like what are little things you mentioned the hints of burnout and you right away took action. So any advice you can give the midwives considering or challenging through the burnout and needing some help? Yeah. So I, um, I'm lear like I'm learning by default that skill. And um, I have that personality to go, go, go and get it done. And I really, I had like these bi big vision, you know, the big uh, business vision of growing the birth center, getting a good solid practice going. And the, I think that this profession is no different than any other business model is that you as the business owner are always going to be tasked to, to the breaking point because that's how small businesses in this country are ran. It really is. It doesn't matter if you're a restaurant owner, you know, um, a clinical practice like us, you know, owning a retail front, you're always putting all your time and effort into your business. So um, I think this last year was really just like my point of like, I, I have to change something or this isn't going to work out long term and making that realization instead of keep, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. So what I've had to do is take small little steps in hiring people to replace. So you'll, you'll read great books that will, um, that teach you business management, right? That are teaching you how to expand, how to um, how to grow your business. And the one skill that comes up repeatedly is you need to pay other people to do the things that, that you don't have to do. 
like managing your email, like doing the billing in your practice, like the scheduling, all the office jobs. Like I don't have to schedule every single person in my, my practice, you know, hiring an office assistant was the huge, even when it was just me, even when it was just me, that made a big impact where I had somebody else to deal with printing up all of the contracts, you know, putting them in the computer, taking payments. It, another big part was when, um, I'll, I'll let everybody in on a little secret. Uh, back in the day, I had a really hard time managing people's money. Not that it was bad. It was that I, I hated confronting people in a midwife environment about paying their bill. <laughs> and that so happens my husband and I so. made up. <laughs> yeah. So here's my little, here's my little confession in my secret is that we made up a fake email and a fake name. And I called this person, my business accountant and this business accountant, I would tell people at my intake, I would say, you know, I, I'm not the money person in this business. Here's the contract. You need to sign it. My accountant's going to call you and they're going to set up all the payments. And if you're ever late, you're going to have to deal with him. And that's what happened. I never Was dealt that with your husband? late payment ever again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and nobody ever knew it was my husband. I love it. We really I wanted people to take it seriously of making their payments. You know, it, it was frustrating for me to sit there and try to be the compassionate person that was giving them this one-on-one -on -one prenatal care. And, and it's then not even like, so much uh, the compassion, it's the conflict of interest. You feel internally, you want to support women, you want to support women. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden there's a transfer and there's a pity yeah. party and you don't want to lose that image of you're yes. the amazing midwife that supported them during labor or the, the birth of their child. And now we've got to talk money. It's a hard shift. And I do encourage a lot of midwives, if they're not cash up front and simple, it, you really should have someone else on your team that handles that, your office manager or somebody else, because it's, it's, a, it's very difficult. Yeah. I know very few midwives that are good at being charismatic where the, the ladies love them still after asking for their payments. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. And I did it for, we did that for three years. Like I was taking all the payments and I, I got good at just like knowing how to approach payments and stuff like that. But after a while, it really, it wore on me. Like, like it was more so that, you know, of course I'm taking care of somebody and I'm more likely to be like, well, you can just pay me next month. Just come in next month with a double payment. You know, if somebody be like, oh, I, you know, we're a little short, but no, I had this, you know, accountant guy who I was just like, uh, your payment's I think that's due. A gold mine, Tisa, I'm glad you shared that secret. <laughs> So that was a big one for me is, is taking that uh, little bit of stress off my shoulders. I remember doing that and I thought this is amazing. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, you know, once we got the office assistant in, that was really big too. And now I'm not like we're teaching, well, I have two office assistants now. We have another full-time midwife. Um, and just being very, one of the biggest things I did, the biggest shift I made, I think that made a big difference in my practice was being very structured with our calendar, because what's very popular in the home birth community is that, um, well, when, when are we going to do our next appointment? What works for you? And instead of that, I had to be very, um, nope, these are the days that we have appointments. These are the availability. Please pick one of these. And that might not work for some very small home birth practices because they like the, the aspect of catering. But I needed to be able to put on my calendar when I was going to do appointments and when I was going to have family time. And, you know, obviously we can never predict the birth environment, but at least I had some kind of structure that I could count on. That was a really big one for me as well as having those and just not, um, we have pretty strict policies even inside the clinic where if people aren't there on time, we tell them that they have to reschedule. There's just a lot of things that I've learned over the last couple of years taking insurance that uh, when somebody is not paying for something, they really do try, they, they act differently and treat the business differently and stuff like that. So we've had to enact a lot of policies around stuff like that and um, not allow people to dictate our time. Yeah. Yeah. And we're no. very particular. Yeah, and then sense. when it comes to work-life balance, I have very strict rules about how people contact me as well. 
So as far as having the on-call phone, um, having mess you know, text messaging whenever they feel like it, I have very strict rules about that too. That that was put that was nipped in the bud a long time ago because, you know, I'd be in bed at night and I'd get a text message at eleven o'clock at night asking me about what time their appointment was the next day, and I'm like, oh hell no, mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. yeah, you're not waking me up for that nonsense. Yeah, we did so the same thing. That initial, we had that practice model of care paper with our our initial educational packet, and exactly. it was it's like these are the ways to communicate. This is the expectation and timeline for urgent, non-urgent, and this is when you can communicate with right. me after eight p.m. And this is how, like, yeah. Well, see, when you start out as a private practice midwife, you you know you have like three clients on your calendar, and you tell them like because you're trying to show them the benefit of having a midwife over going to like the traditional OB model. And one of the biggest benefits is having that 24 hour access to your midwife. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't realize what a burden that would put on me um, until I got super busy until we were doing, you know, 40, 50, 60 births a year. And I had, you know, a constant 60 to 75 people in my practice at any given moment. So I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, getting 14 text messages a day from people just asking very like, you know, just general questions. And I'm like, we got, we got to figure out a way to, to mitigate this and help people understand that that's just not something they need to text me at, at nine 30 at night or six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So no, we put some very good. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people think about that until they get busy. And the earlier you establish that, um, those barriers with your clients and people, like once you've established them, they, they're like, yes, I totally understand. I totally appreciate your time. You got to, you got to get them to understand that like, you're not superhuman and that, you know, you, well, you, I think that's hard have, as a new midwife, you like you said, when you're off. new and you're just starting out, you want people so badly. And so your mindset is, well, this is an right? extra sales tactic that they can access me 24 seven. If I start putting these rules of when they can exactly. communicate with me, they're going to less likely pick me. And I think it's so important to talk to midwives in general. You need to be honest and transparent who you are, what your practice is like, your flow and your style, because it just causes challenges and heartaches right. later when you're when those things come out about who you are and on it and your style of midwifery and flow of practice. Exactly. And that's exactly what, you know, I've had to, you, you learn it. I think, I think for us to talk about it, it, I think oh, we every midwife is going to have too. to I was like, okay, I'm tired have of their moment. <laughs> calls at four in the morning over, can I take coles for not pooping <laughs> for three days? I'm like, uh, you should have told me how many days ago. For yes. real, for real. Right. So, um, yeah, I just, I've had it all. I've had it all. I've had someone leave my office 15 minutes, ask me, you send me a text, like, when's my appointment again? Even though I have an appointment system that will text them all the reminders, like, oh. come on now, people. Yeah. So, you know, so just things, it, having that, I, I've definitely, I think I'm a little above and beyond most people. We have multiple phones in our practice that are very specific for what you call this phone for that and this phone for that. That's just because um, I, I definitely don't like the, I don't want to switch lines. I don't want to forward lines. I don't want to do this. And th there's one phone for emergencies. There's one phone to call our office. And that's all there is to it. So yeah, we did the old um, school. Pager so those are system. my biggest tips. Yeah, we did the old school with the multiple midwives. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah we did. We because we were like, okay, how do we forward? And then an app, and it was so complicated. So I I figured out how to clone exactly. old school pagers, and that was the emergency after hour. They didn't know who was on call. We were like, oh, do we make a calendar? But then we'd have to update them every time it switched, and we just made it easy. Like this right. is what we call for after hour labor related issues, and they didn't. They had our cell phone numbers, but it was like a last resort after, okay, 30 minutes of no response is like an algorithm. So yeah, I think that helps to make clearer expectations of here's our office number, here's our email, here's our after hours and what are their uses, so. Yep, exactly. So that's in our intake packet as well. And we, you know, that's, we, we address it. We, um, one of the, I will say one of the biggest um, changes I made this last year was my consultation intake and orientation process where I going from a smaller practice who was probably only doing 30 births a year 
and moving to some, you know, we're closer to 80 to 100 births a year this last year, um, doubling in size. So what I did is I took, I took some business models again, and we recorded everything, which I know a lot of practices did this year because of COVID, where you weren't doing a lot of things in person. So our, we now have an orientation video that they get to view instead of me going through everything with them, like this is how you do X, Y, and Z. They get the orientation video, they watch the whole thing, it goes through how to contact us, the reasons why you want, what are emergency reasons, you know, what are the precautions for pregnancy, uh, supplementation, we go through nausea and vomiting and all the protocols for nausea and vomiting, and then we go through all our book recommendations and their nutrition recommendations, awesome. so it's all done that. before they even show up. And that was, a because, you know, an intake could take an hour and a half if you're going through this stuff in person. Um, and it gave, it really, I think uh, we also schedule phone intakes now where we go through the medical records in a phone interview rather than going through the medical records in the in-person intake. So this is all done before they physically come in for their exam. That way, before they come in, we can already, as a midwife, as a practitioner, already have our list of questions for the client. Like, how long have you been on this medication? Why have you been taking it? You, you marked here that you had an abnormal pap. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, that, that has been very beneficial instead of me like looking at the records while they're still sitting there in my office, trying to figure out what I need to But it also reduces the risk of you getting right somebody, you can have a chance and have, especially even a newer midwife, like you can look through their medical history. Are they a good candidate? And is you're trying to be very precious time. Right. I think sometimes so many midwives will do all the consults and then they'll decide the next visit if they're a good candidate. When you do a phone screening, you can save yourself a lot of time of ones that may not be, maybe their insurance, Absolutely. maybe they had X, Y, Z in the past. And so it, it is helpful to make sure they're already yeah. a good candidate for your practice before you do that first visit. Exactly. Well, and then you already know if they need consultations as well. So that was yeah. very time consuming, just getting having that process kind of streamed line. And then that's, um, you know, what we like to call replicatable in your, in your practice as well, where you're not, I remember back in the day when I was doing all this stuff in person and I'd be like, man, I forgot to talk to them about that. And then, you know, but yeah. now I know that everybody's getting the same information. And as I hire new midwives, this information will be consistent. Well, thank you so much, Tisa. I could talk to you for hours and hours. I really enjoy just the knowledge <laughs> and what you're passing on to everyone. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, maybe in a couple of months, we could do another video and see if maybe there's some topics people bring up in the comments or just have questions. Um, what yeah, is the best absolutely. way? Are you open for if anybody sends you an email or has a question about something, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, I think so. I know this is, I for me, I'm not a writer. I hate writing. And so if anybody ever wanted to chat with me, I'm totally open. Just send me an email saying that, hey, are you open to, to having a phone call conversation and then just scheduling a phone call? Because okay. I travel a lot like most of us midwives do. And I like to talk while I'm in the car. <laughs> yep, And that's totally fine. Everybody is different. So yeah, if you just have shoot an email to your website and um, what is the, is the link just the name of the practice? Yeah, so A, is in alpha, V is in Victor, so avbirthcenter.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Tisa, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too.